One of the most <clears throat> popular classes that we teach at the Boston Wine School is our Intro to Wine class. It's, it's called, very simply, How to Taste Wine and Why. Rosé is diverse. Rosé can be red grapes only. It can be red grapes blended with white grapes. It can be fortified. It can be sparkling. It can be off dry. It can be bone dry. It can, you can have a 15 course meal and have a different style of rosé with every single course. How does your love of wine contribute to climate change? The reality is that wine growing regions are disproportionately affected by climate change. All right, hello, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming out tonight. How are we feeling out there? Everybody doing well? That was a rousing, that was a rousing start. It doesn't always start off that rousing. How much wine have you guys had already? This is gonna be a fun night, I can tell already. Well, welcome to WGBH and, uh, and welcome to Boston Talks. My name is Edgar B. Herwick III. Uh, I run WGBH's Curiosity Desk and uh, host this little gathering that we do here uh, every month uh, for most of the year. And uh, we are thrilled to kind of finish up our season with, uh, with, an, uh, with a theme tonight that I know uh, some of the folks who organize this thing have really been looking forward to, of course, our theme, Rosé All Day. We like Rosé? Are we generally fans? Our first speaker. Uh, this is a man who uh, has written about wine in all kinds of ways, short form articles, books. He talks about wine uh, on the radio. If you're a listener to 89.7, you've probably heard him. He's been doing it for years for us. Uh, and he also runs uh, the Boston Wine School, a snob free zone for those who are interested in learning about wine. Uh, and now he's going to share some of his knowledge with us. Please welcome to the stage, Jonathan Alsop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you, everyone. It's great to, uh, great to be here. I'm uh, Jonathan Alsop. I'm the founder and um, executive director of the Boston Wine School. Um, sometimes people look at the Boston Wine School and um, look at this beautiful mess you see before you and say, um, how the hell does something like that happen? Um, how does a person become um, a wine writer and a wine um, educator. Um, got into wine um, educating through writing about wine. Um, I started life as a, a corporate speech writer. Uh, speeches, scripts, soundtracks, screenplays, that sort of thing. Um, and in the um, mid-1980s, I had an opportunity to write about wine for a, for a corporate event. Uh, that was the first time I had ever really written about wine or written about food at all. I grew up in Southern Ohio. My family's all from Southern Kentucky, where kind of where Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee come together. Um, we're more beer and corn whiskey people. We think about, we think about wine. It's more of a, more of a, more of a, a rich sort of, we, our, our worldview is it was always sort of a rich, kind of a snobbish sort of Yankee thing. Um, but I had this opportunity to write about wine. Um, it was actually about uh, able to write about Australian wine, uh, which really wasn't um, wasn't in the United States really in the 1980s. Um, Al Gore hadn't really invented the internet at that point. Um, so when it came to writing about it, my client says, "Look, here are the wines we're tasting. Uh, you taste them and you um, and you write about them." And I'm saying, "Okay, what?" What will I write? And he's like, "Oh, you've you've read wine writing. It's just a lot of." magical mystery tour, psychedelic gibberish. You can, surely you can do that. And saying to myself, well, yes, surely I can do that. Um, and that was the first time that I had really, um, that I really tasted wine technically and started to ask questions about wine. I know from the outside, the wine world seems extremely closed, you know, extremely um, cult of experthood and very credentialed. But in fact, the wine world's uh, quite open. And once I started to become interested in wine and decided that I wanted to write about wine, it was really just a matter of calling, calling people up and saying, hey, um, it's me, Jonathan, the wine writer. And you know, unlike, um, <clears throat> unlike pediatric brain surgery, which you really can't get into just by having a passion for, um, in the wine world, the reaction is sort of, hey, Jonathan, the wine writer, where you been? We've, we've been waiting for you. And 
started writing about wine and teaching about wine and um, ultimately um, now here everyone and here all we are. Um, like I said, I started, uh, uh, started my wine life as a wine writer, I'm author of uh, In Vino Veritas, which is a syndicated wine column and wine lover's devotional, 365 days of wine. Let me tell you just a little bit real quick about the Boston Wine School. Um, as Edgar was saying, we do classes, we do private parties, we do private events, a lot of great education for people up there at the, at the top of the wine world. Um, what about everyone else? What about, what about people who love wine or work with wine? Um, this is where Boston Wine School comes in, where wine education for, for, for anyone, for everyone. And as Edgar said, we're a 100% snob-free zone um, where a lot of you can stay. Um, but we're a 100% snob-free zone where people can come and, and learn about wine. One of the things people want to learn about wine, especially these days, is what is rosé? And rosé is called many different things around the world. It's called uh, rosato, rosado. Uh, we call it blush. Uh, we call it van gris. And what we're talking about essentially is, when we talk about rosé, we're talking about uh, pink wine. And the question is, what makes pink wine pink? And this really is uh, very much the same, uh, same sort of larger question, is what makes, what, what makes any wine what color it is, what makes white wine white, what makes red wine red. Um, and it seems obvious, right? Red wine's made from red grapes, white wine's made from white grapes. That's not completely it. Um, so red wine is red grapes fermented with its skins. Um, if you've ever, ever peeled a black grape, the, the meat of a black grape is white. The juice of a black grape is white. It's fermenting it's fermenting black grapes with their skin. That's where the color comes from. That's where the, um, the, texture, the texture that red wine has that white wine doesn't. It has that because of its being fermented and in contact with the skins. White wine is just the juice of white grapes not fermented in contact with their skins. And rosé is um, red grapes made in the white wine style. Red grapes made as if they were white wine. So when you take, you take a couple of tons of black grapes, you squeeze out the juice, you get a little color, right? You get a little pigment from the skin, but essentially what you're doing is you're, you're, you're squeezing out that, that white juice and then just dealing with it. Essentially, your um, rosé is exactly what we see here. It's red grapes made into white wine. Um, another question that people ask, comes up in <laughs> wine class pretty frequently, is it sick to love pink wine? And we never ask a question that we don't already know the answer to. And we know the answer is no, it's not sick to love pink wine. Pink wine is fantastic, super popular. Um, <clears throat> we also know, um, hate, haters gonna hate, uh, there are people who don't love red wine, or who don't love rosé. What is it they don't love about it? Rosé, so shallow, so pointless, so one-dimensional. What, 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 what am I drinking here? Where did this come from? Did this come from some kind of bulk wine puppy mill? Where, what, 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 is, in, what is in here? And uh, rosé, come on, you could have been a red wine. You should just if you just applied yourself a little bit. Now, we don't exactly, uh, we don't exactly agree with this worldview. We're, we're, of course, rosé lovers. What is it to people who love rosé love about it so much? So shallow, <laughs> so pointless, so one-dimensional. Rosé, we love that about you. Um, winemakers will tell you that, that, that every wine uh, every wine has a has a every wine has a story. Every wine is sending you some kind of message, and we love the message of rosé, which is um, "shut up and drink me." Um, and a lot of people love rosé, and this is one of the reasons why I really love rosé. It really is. It really does represent, in many, in many ways, the best of both worlds. Um, it's light. It's cold. It's got that crisp charm that we love in a white wine, but it is made from red grapes. So it is a, 
it is a white wine that's got that white wine charm, but also got a little bit, also got a little bit of that red wine oomph uh, that we really like, uh, that we really like as well. Um, one of the most <clears throat> popular classes that we teach at the Boston Wine School is our Intro to Wine class. It's, it's called very simply How to Taste Wine and Why. And one of the things that we teach in that class, and I want us to go over it real quick before we, um, before we get too much farther into tonight, is um, <clears throat> what we call the 7S system of wine tasting. Uh, this is a system we teach. Is the distinction between hedonistic wine tasting, which we've only just met, but I feel like everyone's in a really good place in terms of mastering hedonistic wine tasting. When you want to learn a little bit more, you want to get a little deeper into the glass, we do something called technical wine tasting, which is represented with this 7S system. Um, everyone, of course, is always fixated on everyone's least favorite S, which is the seventh S. You can change that. You can change that to swallow, but then you end up with the 10 with the 10S system of wine tasting, uh, which can become problematic. So let's just, let's just leave this right where it is. And Edgar, we're going we're gonna to go through this. I know you've been, um, I know you've been um, nominated to be the guinea pig here. Guinea pig. Well, I know yeah. you've been which I, which I accepted wholeheartedly. And I know you've yeah. been practicing this a lot on your own. Oh, yeah. So, All day uh, today, actually. Yeah. I've been drunk right. since 10 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> That's not true. Super. That's a joke. So Especially each, if my boss is still upstairs, so, definitely a joke. Yep. So each step in the process starts with the letter S. It makes okay. it easy to remember. The first S is C. I mean, this is one of the things we love about. All right. This is one of the things we love about rosé. Is really, it's got great. It's got aroma. It's got flavor. We're what really we, obsessed with its visual. So what are we component. looking for in the C part? We're look just just to note what it looks like. Just like to, something I mean, like pink. Something like this is pink. Is it light pink? Light pink. Is it dark pink? Yeah. It's it's the same sort of thing that happens when we look at a plate of food it is does it look delicious does it look delicious is this is this what i ordered <laughs> yeah. um, next does it have is, enough salt next on s it is sniff just make sure make sure it actually is wine right next s is swirl like why do we really, now why do we swirl really get it going around you you should be um you should you should actually definitely be splashing some of that on me if you're really doing it right um Next S, is, next S is smell. Get your nose down in there and get your nose down in there and smell it. In general, when we swirl the wine, it, it, makes, the aroma, it makes the aroma stronger because we're, we've got a larger surface area. We're kind of agitating the aromas up into the glass. Uh, next, S, yes. next, next S is sip. It's just like a quick sort of the sniff equivalent. Just, just wet your lips with it. Let it, let it disperse across your palate. Mm -hmm. It also tastes like wine. Oh, yeah. Next two S's, uh, swish and spit. Uh, you can make this wine uh, disappear with the uh, technique of your choice. Yeah. But the idea is to take it into your mouth and let it be there. Let it spend a few minutes. Swish it around real That's gently. That's the swish. Not only, not only does it make the flavor stronger, um, this is how we touch the wine. This is how we feel the wine. This is how we have something to say about, about the about the texture of the wine. Um, what are we trying to pay attention to in the swish process? Well, as I'm swishing it, what, are, like, what am I trying to unlock in my brain, you, in my experience? Well, you're trying to turn up the volume of the flavor, so okay. you got a, the most intense flavor. It makes a bigger impression on you, easier to remember. You have more to say about it. Um, and, and just try to, it's just like turning up the volume on a piece of music. When you turn up the volume on a You're piece like, of yeah. music, sure, it gets louder, but you start to hear detail inside the music at a higher volume that you didn't get at the lower volume. That's, we're, we're not just yeah. doing this to alienate normal people. <laughs> um, as, as so well, it can have as, that as, effect. As, as well as it works. Um, it's all about turning up the volume on the aroma, turning up the volume on the flavor, and just getting cr crawling, crawling into the glass, and just getting a little more out of the when out of the glass. When and we're out of doing the, wine. the swish, are we? Is it like? Yeah, we really exactly, go for it. Like we don't, we don't exact, try to. We're not it's exactly just like, like that. pushing it around. We're well, like, shwak, quak, 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 like eventually, like, eventually, like mouthwash. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, eventually, your family okay. and loved ones will intervene <laughs> if you do it too intensely. But, 
But it really, you've got to find your own level. So you, yeah. really... so you want to go high and let somebody pull you back rather exactly. than have to be brought exactly. up to... Okay. People will right. tell you if, you're gone, yeah. uh, if you've gone too far. <laughs> All right. Um, and so what we're tasting here, this is the 2018 uh, Rotation Rosé. This is from Lodi, California. Um, this wine represents two... Um, uh, trends that we're super in love with at the Boston Wine School. One is obviously uh, rosé, and the other is uh, blended wines. So not only is this, you know, we've we got some like Heisenberg uncertainty principle level quantum blending going on here. Because wow. not only is this like a blended wine, the rosé is made from a blend. So it's not only a blended wine, it's it's blended a meta blend. It's a meta. Blend. It's a, it's a we meta. Have, it's we have a meta it's a, blend. Happening. It's a meta blend. Okay. So, all right. Rotation, rotation, rosé. And if you're interested in it, go up to BostonWineSchool.com/rotation, and you can read some more information, and you can, you can order it and enjoy it and taste more of it um, as well. Jonathan Alsop. Let's hear it for him. Thank you. Thank all right, you. don't go Thank yet, though. I've got, I've got a couple of questions for you before okay. we take another break here. Um, yeah, I can go to Boston Wine School, check it out. Like, how, how does it work? Is it one-off classes? Is it series? Okay. Is it, like, what's the, what's the deal? We, the we basics. Do a, so in terms of our classes, we do a little bit of everything. We do a, a level one certificate program. We do a level two certificate program. We also do one-night classes that are just a two-hour class. Um, uh, wine, cheese, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? <laughs> just a, just a two-hour, uh, best new wines you never heard of. Just two hours of new grapes and new wines and new ideas. Um, so different days of the week, different price points, different kinds of time commitment. Um, trying to be a little something for everybody if we can. You know, I, I think about you telling the story earlier uh, about sort of your entry into this. Mm. And, um, you know, it sounds like what you were doing prior was you were something of a generalist. You know, you probably wrote about lots of things, mm -hmm. you know. And not yeah. that... Order, you... order now and save. <laughs> that, was, that was me. That was you? Yeah. That, you that came was, up with that, that was, one. That was order mine. now yeah. and save. That, yeah. was a, that was a very famous line. <laughs> that's the kind of writing. That's, that's, that's kind of writing. Thank you. Should've that's the kind of writing I was it. doing before I got into my writing. <laughs> And if you act now, we'll throw in a second <laughs> pair of blue blocker sunglasses. Did you write that one? Uh, no, I, I mean, I'm curious about what it was about wine that when you sort of started down that path, you went, oh, there's more here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go like, rather than kind of be a mile wide and an inch deep right. on things, I'm going to go deep on wine. Why, why has it kept you interested? Well, so, so um, I studied journalism in school. I always... I have this sort of, um, I don't know if you guys noticed, picked up on this, I've got this sort of pompous, unbearable side to me, right? Like I always wanted to be a real writer, always looking for that topic, you know, sitting with my father, tasting wine, saying, what am I going to write about? He's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, what can I write about? You know, just year, years, it just seems so far away. Um, and then when I started writing about wine, it was something, um, you know, writers get... Um, Writers get this piece of advice over and over again, which I think is just terrible, terrible advice. They say, write what you know. Yeah. And uh, no, no, don't write what you know. Find something you don't know that interests you, and, and preferably something that other people don't know that interests them. Learn about that, write about that, communicate that to other people. I love that. And, and that's what I found in wine. I, you know, the first wine tasting I did, I was asking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like everybody else. I'm saying, okay, Chardonnay, what's that? Is that, is that a grape? Is that a town? Is, it, is, is that Ralph and Phyllis Chardonnay? I mean, what, what are we looking at here? Yeah. And it was yeah. always something super, super interesting. And um, just was able to write. I just found myself able to write not necessarily about wine, but about life and the world through this prism of yeah. wine and wine tasting. Very cool. All right, final question, and I'm, I think I'm going to ask this of all of our guests tonight. Can you give me a, a, a rosé memory, some, some evening or event or night that you either remember or only slightly remember, of which rosé was an important part? You, you know, I'm, I'm, I can. And <laughs> Excellent. I, I can, and I'm going to. Um, Junior year in high school. 
junior in high school, my folks are out of town. Who else was at that party? Who else was at that party? Yeah, yeah. My friend Jim Webster, um, he, he, he went on to be an engineer, which you'll understand when I finish the story. He took a box of Blossom Hill, box of wine. And so, so what we call box of wine is actually bag in box. If you take the box apart, there's like yeah. a mylar bag in yeah. there. We had, like a, we had like a box of Blossom Hill, and he uh, took the box and taped, taped the bag to his torso <laughs> and ran, this is the engineer part, ran a little tube up like his back <laughs> through his collar so that we could go to this party and he could drink <laughs> body temperature Blossom Hill Rosé. <laughs> in 1973, while my parents were out of town. Jonathan Alsop, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ed. We're going to move on to our next speaker now. Uh, as I was saying earlier, there were only, and I think this is right, 257. Is that the right number? There are 257 people in the world who have been certified as master sommeliers. That's it. 257 out of about seven billion people on the planet. It's a pretty, I don't know, I can't really do the math in my head, but that is a very low percentage. And uh, one is here tonight, and uh, he's gonna talk to us a little bit about what that means, and of course we're gonna talk about Rosé. And he's going to, uh, part of his mission, I understand, is to make us all the best wine drinkers we can be. So please welcome to the stage, Michael Marr. Good evening. Michael. Edgar. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. Wine, well yeah, we both yeah, have wine. Good. That's great. I'm funnier when I have wine. <laughs> no. That's good. We like funny. That's good. That's great. Do you remember the first time you ever had wine? Um, vaguely. I was five. <laughs> um, and there's actually photo documentation of this. Really? Because, um, I was five years old. I was out, um, I have family that lives in the San Francisco area. So my, my mother, uh, bless her soul, dragged two children onto a cross-country flight, uh, ages five and three. And one of the excursions that my aunt and uncle had us all go do was to go visit a winery and you know, do wine tasting. Like you do out there. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, With five-year-olds. My, five -year -olds my mom needed yeah, a drink. Classic. Um, <laughs> after that. And so there's a photo, a photo of uh, me, my brother, my mom, my aunt, my uncle, sitting at Ridge Vineyards um, up in Cupertino. And we're all sitting at a picnic table. And apparently I, I dipped my finger into the glass of wine. Because it was the 80s and it didn't matter. And um, that was my first wine experience. Um, and I, I assume it was good because I still like the winery to this day. Uh, <laughs> so uh, how, about as a, how about sort of a little bit more as an adult? Was, was, it, was it sort of like, you know, a magical moment when you tasted wine and you were like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever tasted and I'm going to... Devote my life to this drink. No, I, um, my path to wine is a little um, unique. I guess no one really grows up wanting to be a sommelier. It's one of those things that, uh, unless you're a five-year-old drinking at a vineyard, um, but it's just, it, it's part of an industry that a lot of people kind of frown upon. Hospitality is seen as something that you do in the interim. Uh, I work in restaurants because I'm waiting for my big break. I work in restaurants for the summer. Um, and one of the problems that um, kind of our industry has is, you know, oftentimes hospitality is taken for granted. So we lose a lot of really talented people because they don't view the hospitality industry as a viable career. We're, we're trying to change that. So um, I went to um, a school across the river um, called Harvard. Um, I was getting my, my degree in sociology, and I worked the, the summers at a catering company. I loved it. I worked Friday and Saturday and made enough money in those two days to pay for beer for the rest of the week. What did you like about it? What was the part that you liked about it? I liked that I could work two days and get enough you money to money. buy beer for the rest of the week. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Um, <laughs> right. But I, yeah. I, I love the energy. I love the hustle. I love yeah. the physicality of it. And uh, more importantly, uh, the events and the people that were enjoying themselves that I just kind of got to be a part of some of these glamorous parties and um, you know, just see a side of kind of life that I hadn't experienced yet. Um, so it came time to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life, senior year of college, and I sent off law school applications and took the LSAT and did everything that I was supposed to do. And like, man, just thought in the back of my head, like, this isn't right. <laughs> Couldn't tell my friends that because they were all applying to law schools and like, this is what I want to do with yeah. my life. And um, I sent uh, an application off to the Culinary Institute of America. Um, 
And that application took about three weeks for it to be returned. Law schools took about three or four months. So as soon as that culinary school application came back saying, congratulations, you've been accepted to the Culinary Institute of America, I'm like, that's what I'm doing. Anthony Bourdain's first book just came out. I'm like, this is fantastic. I'm going to be famous. <laughs> and so that's one of the questions they ask when they get there, when you get to culinary school, um, is why are you here? And you have to realize it's a hard industry and you're working awful hours and you're never going to see your family on holidays again. You're probably going to miss a lot of events and you're going to do a lot of stuff that, again, is, is difficult to do, but I found this energy in it. I love this enthusiasm. So I cooked for a couple of years here in Boston, uh, Hammersley's Bistro and um, settle a terror. Sadly, all the restaurants I used to work for no longer exist. Well, but it's because you left. Not they fell because apart. of, yeah. No, they, because you I left, left and they fell apart. Yeah, um, instit- obviously. Legendary institutions, but I realized that cooking wasn't quite for me, so I moved to Australia, which is the sensible thing to do when you're reevaluating your life choices. Who hasn't done that? Um, and enrolled in a master's degree program at the University of Adelaide in gastronomy. And everyone thought, oh, he's going to become a doctor. Great. Um, and it was... Gastronomy is the study of food and wine and history and culture. And I'm like, yeah, I'm becoming a doctor. You're right. I'm going to Australia to become a doctor. Um, and while I lived in Australia, I really started getting a little bit more into wine. I lived in Adelaide. It was a two-hour drive to the Barossa Valley, 45 minutes to McLaren Vale, to Adelaide Hills, all these world-class wine regions in my backyard. I was scared, though, because if I loved wine the way I love food and then I get into wine, it was going to destroy my love of wine like cooking destroyed my love of Food. Like the danger of making your passion right. your work. And I was terrified, but I came back and got back into restaurants and went to a wine dinner and asked the wine director at Cell de who I had known. I went to a wine dinner, had a couple too many glasses of wine, and said, so you have a job for me. And that was my interview. He said, come back in a couple of days, uh, June 1st, and you're hired. I'm like, wow, that was awesome. June 1st is inventory. So I'm in ratty clothes, crawling around you know, basements, counting bottles of wine. I'm like, well, this isn't as glamorous as I thought, but I really still like this. Um, worked at Les Bollier and Cell de la Terre. Um, again, no longer in existence, but not my fault. And I was hooked. Um, the wine bug had fully kind of bitten me. And the recession came around in 2008, and I just passed. I was the first person in Boston to pass the advanced sommelier examination. <laughs> And I celebrated by getting laid off. I'm like, wait, that's not supposed to happen. So I, I kind of did some soul searching. I'm like, well, I, I want to stay in wine. What do I do? Um, because up to that point, restaurants were the only thing you could do in wine. You could go to the dark side. I put that in quotes. And you could become a, a distributor or a supplier. Um, but that meant you know, being awake during you know, normal daylight hours and actually seeing my family and friends again. I'm like, OK, yeah, let's give this a try. So I spent several years. Um, in that side of the industry. Um, you know, got to travel a lot, got to meet some amazing people across the country because now I started working for national wine companies and suppliers which have global reach. So I got to go back and visit Australia. I got to go to France. I got to go to Italy. I got to go to Spain. Um, again, a little bit, you know, it, it's, it's, it's sexy work. You got to travel the world and visit these horribly beautiful places. And it was just another day at the office. Um, so, so it really is that cool. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and all, the, so. all this time, I'm, I'm studying and studying and, and um, preparing for the Master Sommelier exam. And the first time I took it was in 2010. And uh, it pretty much you know, tanked, bombed. Um, was embarrassed walking out of there. Felt, tor- felt horrible about it. But it's, it's a very encouraging thing to know that it's a you know, 5% pass rate. Um, it's been Did called... you say 5? 5. five. Um, of the 150 people that go and take it on a given year, maybe five or six will pass. What is on the test? Uh, like, what is the test? I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, uh, so the Master Sommelier exam is a three-part examination. Um, the most glamorous part is the tasting, because it's something, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the documentary Psalm. Um, there's, a, there's some television shows about it. Tasting wine is good to put on television, um, because you see you know, empty glasses and spit buckets and all this detritus that's left behind after a pack of sommeliers comes through your living room. And it's something we can relate to because we can all sit down and taste a glass of wine and start to think about what am I getting, what am I tasting. And the goal of these six, you know, the test is six wines in front of you and you have 25 minutes on the clock, which sounds like a really long time, but it breaks down to about four minutes and 10 seconds per wine. And you have to go through and talk about what you see, what you smell, what you taste, and come up with a logical conclusion of what is in the glass, where it's from, the grape variety, the vintage, and any sort of quality level. The vintage? Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why I love wine, because it's 
hugely academic, and there's this ever-expanding universe of information you can try to absorb. So it tied together all of my background um, in education, and I, I love that, um, but it's, and that's just the tasting aspect of right. it. Then there's the practical or the service element where they put you into a ballroom in a hotel, usually a very lovely hotel of Four Seasons or something of that equivalent, and you're to pretend that that ballroom is your dining room that you worked in for the other 364 days of that year. And you're asked to pr go through tasks like opening a red wine, decanting a table side, uh, champagne service at your table, food and wine pairing, all done on the fly. This is all done verbally. This entire exam is done verbally. So the tasting exam is done verbally, the service, obviously, you're doing that verbally, and then that comes to the theory portion, the third element, where you basically sit down in a room, again, you're in a hotel, so it's probably a, either a, a guest room or a conference room, you're sitting across the table from master sommeliers, and they're going to basically ask you 40 minutes worth of the hardest questions you could probably come up with in the world of alcoholic beverages. You're like, well, wait, sommelier means wine, but we have to know about beers and sakis and spirits and ciders and anything that you can drink. Terrifying. So after those three days, um, you find out if you passed any of the sections. And if you did, yay. Um, if you didn't, okay. Um, and you get, to, you get three years to pass all three of the sections. Okay. If you don't pass after three years, you have to take them all you again. You start again. Start over again. It took me six times. So I was on my sixth attempt. I had reset once. I was facing another reset. Um, so it was kind of um, my wife was going to have the come to Jesus moment where do we really have to go through this again? <laughs> Um, but I didn't have to worry about that, and I passed, and it was uh, certainly one of the professionally the, the happiest days of my life because yeah. I never had to do it again. <laughs> um, do you get to now, like, exam other people for it, like, yeah, once yeah. you're in? One of the coolest parts of, of being a Master Sommelier is becoming a mentor. Um, that's one of the, the, the proudest elements of being a Master Sommelier is going and really starting to meet the leaders of the industry 10, 15 years from now and seeing these incredibly talented people who gave up their job in pharma or in biotech because they love hospitality, um, who have amazing pedigrees in terms of their background, making more money than, than, than they need to, but decide they want to do something better with their life. And this is what they gravitate towards, hospitality. Um, people love wine for sure, but to do it for a living takes something beyond passion because you have to realize this can be an addictive substance and you need to know when to say no, you need to know when to turn it off, you need to know what the boundaries are because it's very easy for a passion just to become, you know, just, just drinking for, for fun. Um, and we've all been there in the industry and we've all hopefully made the right decisions, sometimes not as many as others, but it's, it's part of it, it's one of the pitfalls. Um, and mentorship and seeing this talent and seeing the next generation come through is awesome. And so I get to give exams, I, I go to very, uh, incredible locations like Greenville, South Carolina, um, West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, you know, it's not always in bustling wine metropolises yeah. because we want to go where the, the passionate people are. And a lot of times that's universities, a lot of times that's up and coming wine cities. Um, but again, it's still reaching out. And it's that same feeling I got working at a table at Celeterre Les Balliers for a, a, a couple that was having their 50th wedding anniversary and having them enjoy that moment. And it's the same kind of feeling that seeing those students when they pass their first level, that introductory exam, the excitement they have, the joy they have, it's that same kind of like, yeah, I'm doing this for the right reasons and I love what I do. That's awesome. Uh, and it sounds like the Master of Sommelier thing's way harder than the LSATs, right? Like... Yeah, yeah. I, I only took the LSATs <laughs> once and I passed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, come I on. I guess you get a numerical score, if, yeah. um, which I, I would say... Um, I've long since forgotten about that, but uh, again, it's, it's not for everybody, and just because you're a master sommelier doesn't make you uh, any better than someone that's never sat the test. I have friends in the industry who've never set foot in any of our examinations or courses, and they're far better at their job than I am. They're far better tasters than I am. There are people in restaurants right now, colleagues that are far more gifted in hospitality and service than I am. I just made the choice years ago to spend tens of thousands of dollars on this pin on my lapel, which is why I wear it all That's the time. That's all you get is a pin? <laughs> it's the it's most expensive a, a thing like I own. Like a sash and a robe and I, a I, secret code something to like somewhere? Flavor, flavor, like, you, a, like a big medallion I can yeah, wear around yeah, yeah, my yeah, neck. Totally. Something like that. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's, it's just cool and it's, I wouldn't yeah. change it for the world, even though yeah. a lot of people looked at me and went, you're, you're doing what? And you're 
but you went there, and you're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be somewhere else. Um, but it's just, uh, you know, it's, the industry is fantastic in getting to meet um, so many wonderful people around the world. It's, it's pretty cool. Let's talk about rosé. Okay. Tell me about rosé. <laughs> it's yummy. Yeah? All right. Professional term. You yummy. Didn't know that. Yummy. All right. Um, rosé is fantastic. I, um, one of my rosé memories, to kind of beat you to that punch, oh, was... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's have it now. Uh, working at Subtle at Terra, we when I started out, we had a program called Wine by the Gas. And we charged for a glass of Matus rosé. Some people will snicker at that. Oh, yeah. It was that we actually, they no. came up with a bottling in, uh, you know, many years ago. That actually was more delicious than some of their other bottlings. So we are like, this is really good. We need to run with this. We charged for a glass of Matus rosé the same price as a gallon of gas. So that price changed every week according to So whatever the price of gas was at that moment, at that's that what moment, you charged. Oh, that's, that's what we charged. So uh, a dollar eighty nine would get you a glass of Matus Rose. A um, dollar ninety six on, a, on a, a rough week would get you a glass. Um, you could play the market and try to gauge when the prices were going to drop. Um, you know, for for those not quite as ambitious to uh, dabble in the stock market, this was this was kind of fun for them. People come in every, every week and be like, "Oh, sweet! I saved six cents on my glass of uh, my glass of wine." We all laugh. We all do the same thing when we're looking for gas, right? We've all driven ten totally. miles out of our way to pay five cents. I have. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I mean, rosé is awesome, and it's it's caught the world by storm. Um, and I why is that? Like why? Like what? You know, like you know, people will say rosé is having a moment, right? Like what? Like why? I think one of the things that Jonathan mentioned is kind of like Goldilocks. It's not white wine. It's not red wine. And you really have to go looking for something to not like in a glass of rosé. So it has this really kind of, you know, democratic appeal to people. Like everyone can be a part of it. Everyone can participate in rosé. Everyone can, you know, raise a glass and vote with, with their wallet on rosé. It can be as light as white wine. It can, you know, there are some Cabernet and Malbec rosés which can drink heavier than Pinot Noir. So it's... It really does have something for everybody. Um, and that's wonderful because it helped get rosé as a category out of the mindset of white Zinfandel. It has to be sweet and 8% alcohol and kind of, I mean, it, it saved the California wine industry, so we can't say too many bad things about it. Um, but we've progressed as a culture. We're the largest wine-consuming country in the world, so good job. Um, Round of applause for yourselves, yeah. everybody. I see everyone contributing. But now we run the risk of rosé falling into this trap. Um, and it sounds a little ironic, but who's gone into a restaurant and without even looking at the wine list saying, I'll have a glass of Chardonnay, a glass of Pinot Grigio, a glass of Cabernet? I've done it. I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room has probably done it as well. What, and, and Jonathan eloquently il illustrated this. Rosé is diverse. Rosé can be red grapes only. It can be red grapes blended with white grapes. It can be fortified. It can be sparkling. It can be off dry. It can be bone dry. It can, you could have a 15 course meal and have a different style of rosé with every single course. But we are now categorizing it as rosé. We're putting every single bottle of rosé into that category. We don't care what it is as long as it's pink. One of the things that I loved about my industry and what I do is I'm a storyteller. I go to a table, I tell them a story, I listen to their story, and we come up with something that's going to help their story through that night. I will recommend, hopefully, a wine that will, might not change your life, but it will make your night better. That's the story I want to help you write. Rosé is falling into that kind of point where, what's the story of Pinot Grigio? Does anybody know? I mean, it, it, it started off as... as you know, Turlot, the Turlotto Wine Company bring over a brand called Santa Margarita, and all of a sudden it caught fire, and everything had to taste like Santa Margarita, and then everything had to be cheaper. We go into a restaurant. I, I um, consult with Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. They have 120 locations in the country. They're my largest client, and we're re re rewriting their wine list for 2020 right now. And we're starting to see Rosé now being able to sustain national placements. We're going to lose some of the romance. We're going to lose some of the terroir. We're going to lose some of that story that Rosé, these, you know, in the Languedoc, um, in Provence, in California, um, in even Burgundy, they're going to lose some of that power behind their category because we all want to drink more of it. So it's kind of like one of those things, like, well, where do we draw the line? What do we do? How do we preserve this, this iconic kind of style of wine but do so in a respectful and responsible manner? Um, 
it's like anything. Too much of anything is, is bad. So we need rosé in moderation. And I love rosé. I love that it's simple, straightforward. One you know, can be like one syllable sitting in my backyard looking at my lawn that I just mowed. That's wine of perspiration. Um, and I, it's great about rosé, but there are also some brilliant rosés at $80, $90 a bottle that are wonderful. That if you close your eyes, you'd be like, this tastes like amazing wine. I place this in Burgundy. It has terroir. It has soul. It has passion. You can taste that in a wine. But we're now lumping my backyard mowing grass with something that's a wine to contemplate. So my mission, you know, I have many of them now. One is just getting everyone to drink as well as they can whenever they can. But my mission is to make people a little bit more aware. Be mindful when you drink. So how do we do that? How, give, us, give us some tips. We're, we're in. Yeah, we we want to be better rosé drinkers. Yeah. Help us. Here's the, simple, here's the simple answer. Ask questions. Don't always revert to your phone looking up the meaning of the world or the meaning of your glass of wine. Interact with your bartender. Interact with your server. Interact with your retailer. Interact with whoever you're buying your wine from. There is a story. There is a reason why that wine is on that shelf, on the, lay, on the, the wine list, in that glass. They've made a decision, and they're standing behind it. So if we ask questions, we become better consumers. We still get our glass of wine. We still get our reward at the end of the day. Um, but now we're becoming a little bit smarter about it, and people are going to know more the answers about the wine that they are buying. They need to have a better backstory. Is there going to be a place for commercial tier rosé? Absolutely. And it's going to be, you know, for the people who don't want to talk, they just want to walk in, grab their $7.99 bottle, and be on their way, and that's totally fine. But I think we're all in this room for a reason. We like wine. We like rosé. We like a little bit more education and knowledge and background. Um, and this is a perfect venue for that. So take this passion while you're here tonight and go out and apply it to whenever you purchase a glass or a bottle of wine out there in, in, you know, beyond these four walls. Michael Marr, everybody. Let's hear it for him. Just without further ado, get, uh, get right into it. So... Who are the people who make wine? This is one of the people who makes wine. Let's hear it for Marion Leitner. How's everybody doing tonight? I am loud under normal circumstances, so this is like, this is like a dream come true for me. Amplify. Anyway, um, my name is Marion Leitner, and I'm the founder of Archer Roos Wines. And yes, to answer the question you're all thinking, we make wine in a can. So just to tell you a little bit about Archer Roos, we are actually Boston-based, Boston-founded. Um, we are a modern company that is bringing terroir-driven wines to consumers in sustainable packaging. We're family-founded. Uh, we do keg and cans. And all of our wines are scalable, but more importantly, they're terroir-driven. What does that mean? That means everything what we heard here tonight about wines that tell a story that's what our brands are all about. So why do we make this, this wine in a can? Well, the reality, to quote one of kind of the big honchos in the industry, Eric Asimov of the New York Times, is that how does your love of wine contribute to climate change? The reality is that wine growing regions are disproportionately affected by climate change. Uh, and we all have to think about, as consumers, how we can change our behavior to protect the wines that we love while, while still preserving the climate to allow them to grow and be wonderful and plentiful. But the big issue in this industry today is that, have you guys all heard about um, you know, terms like uh, biodynamic, organic, right? The thing is, is that that's a really important part of the conversation, but that's just one piece. That's about how the wine is grown. I want to talk about the wider supply chain of wine to make sure that we can protect these grapes that we love and these styles of wine and drink them from years to come. So sustainability and our thoughts about sustainability have to extend beyond how wine is grown. And we need to focus on this larger carbon footprint. 66% of the wine industry's impact is actually based off of how the wine is made, how it's shipped, and how it's produced. Metal cans are 100% and infinity, infinity recyclable. Infinable. Infinable. 
Uh, using recycled aluminum reduces energy by 95%. 95%. And once emptied, beverage cans can be back on the store shelf as new cans in as little as 60 days. Pretty awesome, right? But at Archer Roos, we really like to think about supply chain holistically. So for us, it does start about where and how the, the grapes are grown. So we work with all low impact sustainable vintners. We're then leveraging excess capacity that exists within the, the wine supply chain, not buying bulk wine, we're making all of our own wine, but we're not going out there and replicating infrastructure that already exists. So our winemakers are going into existing wineries and making the wine, and then, this is my favorite part, we ship it in a 24,000 liter flexi tank. Picture the biggest game of slap the bladder you could possibly imagine. And that's how we actually transport our rosé from Provence, France, where it's produced, to upstate New York, where it's put into cans and kegs. Pretty crazy, right? So before anybody I mean, I remember the first time I went home and said, Dad, I want to start a canned wine company. <laughs> yeah, that went over real well at Thanksgiving. Uh, but the interesting thing is that historically, wine has always been served in lots of different vessels. Uh, they actually were served right out of clay and fora. Or if you go to real kind of wine societies, they'll just pour wine directly from a, a oak barrel and put it into a, in a jug and serve it to you. Or any of you who have gone to France and Italy, I'm sure you've ordered the house wine and it's just kind of showed up on your table. That's probably where it came from. So why is that the case? That's because up until 1972, most of the wine that was produced globally was not put into a bottle. The only wines that were put into the bottle were meant to be bottled aged. So why did that change? Well, in 1972, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, decided to standardize the 750 milliliter bottle, which we should talk about, by the way, five glasses of wine. I mean, who gets that fifth glass if you're sharing it with somebody? Uh, but they standardized that format for taxation purposes. And because of global standardizations of packaging, everybody put cheap wine into a bottle to upsell Americans, the result of which is that you actually pay more for the shipping and the packaging than the wine inside the bottle. And if that doesn't make a Yankee mad, I don't know what will. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about cans and why they're more sustainable. Thanks to our unique supply chain, we are 80% less landfill and 60% less carbon footprint. Single serving cans means eliminating waste. So no more throwing out that half bottle of wine. Just, well, I mean, I don't know about you, but I often don't have half a bottle of wine left. So like, let me put it to you in a different way. Imagine it's a Monday night and you come home and you say, I just want a glass of wine tonight. With a can, you can just have just one. So all of you are now thinking, man, this can thing, it sounds quite logical. I can literally drink my way to a better planet, cleaner planet. But I still have all of these concerns about this, this canned wine thing. And all I have to say is, yes, you can. So the first question I often get asked is, does the aluminum leach into a can? How many of you drink canned beer in this room? It's the same food grade lining that protects beer that goes into protecting wine in a can. The next one that I always get is wine gets better with age. And while that is 100% true of people, that's not always true of wine. Because most of the wine, well, historically speaking, the only wines that were meant to vintage age were the ones that had exceptional years. 97% of all wine that's bought and drunk in this country is less than two years old and it's consumed, and this is why I love America, 72 hours after purchase. <laughs> In other words, when you go out and you say, oh, I can't buy canned wine because I'm aging it, I just want to look at you funny and say, bullshit. 
The other thing that's kind of interesting is I hear a lot is, well, wine in a bottle wouldn't exist unless it was the best format for the wine. But as other people who have spoken here tonight can even talk about better than I can, the reality is that for the wines that we are drinking, cans actually make better sense. The whole point of bottle aging wines is that discrete amount of oxygen come in through the cork and help kind of modify and mature the wine inside the bottle to make it a more delicious, interesting drinking experience. But for young wines that are meant to be drunk fresh, like rosé, um, with some exceptions, that we, it, the can actually protects it against uh, any imperfections caused by light, um, as well as against oxygen entirely. And finally, the last question I always get is, well, yeah, but do I have to drink it directly from a can? Well, look, I'm not gonna judge you. <laughs> but my real answer to that is, do you drink wine directly from the bottle? <laughs> I won't judge you. But this is really just about a vessel. This is just another form of delivery for the wine. So when we are served at restaurants like Copper Smith and Branch Line, they pour our wines directly into a wine glass. Um, and as I hope that you can all taste, you know, this is, our wines are meant to stand up to any quality of a typical bottle of wine that you would buy. Um, so again, does this work great for if you're going to the beach or you're sailing or you're hiking? Absolutely. The best thing about canned wine is it allows you to bring great wine wherever you are. And it liberates wine from this kind of white tablecloth, cork screw, you know, I have to always think about what I'm drinking idea of when we think about uh, wine culture. But it's also meant to be savored. And this is really just a vessel and a, tr and an, and a way to transport it to your glass. So let's talk a little bit about the wine that you're drinking. So the wine that you're drinking is from the Provence Shelf in France. It is, Carign it is a Grenache, Carignan, uh, Syrah, and Uni Blanc. So those are three different red, wine, uh, red grapes, excuse me, that were blended together with a little bit of white uh, grape as well to kind of add a sense of freshness, freshness and acidity to it. Uh, it is you know, the soil where it comes from is from limestone and like really hard stones, it's a very stony kind of soil. So what does that really mean? Um, because honestly, it just tastes delicious. Is that when we drink this, we just want you to think about lavender fields and strawberries and Southern France and all the glories that come with looking out over the beautiful Mediterranean Sea while you're drinking a lot of rosé on the beach. So, Next, I'm going to talk about something kind of interesting, because there is one problem with rosé all day, and that's that IPA drinkers have nothing on rosé drinkers. This is 13% alcohol. Oh yeah, baby. So what is the answer to, oh crap, I just drank five cans of Archer Roos on the beach. It's 13% alcohol a shot. Well, yeah, you're going to do what Jonathan was talking about earlier, which is stumble, swagger, and spew. But we have a solution for you, and that's the second wine that we're going to have you taste here tonight. And that is Spritz by Archer Roos. And this is the world's first low-alcohol sparkling rosé. It's 6% alcohol. What does that mean? It's half the alcohol. You can drink two of them. And you're not imbibing any more calories. It's just 90 calories a can, less than two grams of sugar. Uh, you can drink this guilt-free. And this is truly the way that you can enjoy your rosé all day. But the, but the best part of this is it still tells a story. All of these grapes are still organically grown. They're from the same vineyard as our uh, traditional rosé is from. Uh, they are handcrafted with care. In fact, the creator of Rosé Spritz is here tonight. Sophie, give a shout out for Sophie, everybody. And we take extra steps to make sure that, you know, it is, and again, continues that really low impact on the environment. 
so that we can all do our better part as human beings to drink our way to a better world. So thank you so much, everybody, for letting me talk a little bit about canned wine tonight. I hope you enjoyed yourselves and learned a little something. And just know that, yes, yes, you can. Obama said it first, but I'm saying it now. Let's hear it for, let's hear it for Marion. Marion. How much pushback in the, in the world of wine do you get when you're sort of out and about in your day and trying to sell this idea to people? Is it, is, do you get pushback? You know, um, I think it's less like pushback once they taste it and more just prejudice because it's something new. Uh, the more, I love to blind taste test people on our wine and once we do that, it's kind of really hard for people to push against this. But it definitely requires a, a leap of the imagination because there is so much ritual around drinking wine. And I guess the thing that I always want to evoke for people is that wine is inherently a democratic drink. Forget what you've known about every interaction with wine you've ever had for thousands of years because wine is man, man's oldest drink. It used to be carried in wineskins in the pants yeah. of, you know, people in the art, soldiers marching across Europe, marching across Eurasia. And so this is really, once again, just allowing wine to be transportable and accessible, but without sacrificing quality, authenticity, and story. Is it easier outside of the, is, like, is it easier outside of the United States? Like, is that, is that idea of linking wine drinking with the rich and the fancy and the snobby is that uniquely American? Like, when you go to places where you talk about where wine, you know, has been around for thousands of years, like, is, there, is that less of an issue? Absolutely. I mean, wine is just a part of your household ritual. They drink it every day, and it's accessible, and it's priced accessibly. Uh, g give me a little bit of what do you love, like, what do you personally love about rosé? I love about, for me, rosé just tastes like like freedom and a wow it does yes. and an insouciance a sense of cheerfulness and carefree uh it it to me it evokes like my favorite people and my favorite places in the world and just a carefree afternoon dare i say it or morning uh, or morning <laughs> So There's I, a reason why we call spritz the breakfast wine. Well, I, you know what though? Like the spritz thing is cool because it's like a session beer, right? Like, it's, like as a beer drinker, I think about that. Like, like good flavor, low alcohol content, so you can like have a couple over the course of a day. Like, it's nice. That's exactly how we call it. It's a, it's the sessionable it's a session wine. wine. Yeah. Session wine. Uh, okay. Final question for you, uh, which I promise to ask of everybody: Do you have a rosé memory? Some moment in your life that you remember or sort of remember, of which Rosé was a central player? Absolutely. <laughs> of course. Um, so I, I can't compete with the stories we've heard tonight, but mine, mine is a little bit more sentimental in that I attribute Rosé to how I met my and became good friends with my now best friend. Huh. So the year was 2014, ladies and gentlemen, and Rosé was not quite the craze that you learned today. And I was heading to Beach Week, a MBA tradition upon graduation, and I was the partner. My husband was the one who had gone through MBA. And I had to go and spend a week drinking with all of his friends who I barely knew uh, because I had been commuting back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Charlottesville, Virginia. And on the way, I said, you know, honey, we need to stop at this wine store so I can get this rosé. Uh, I'm sorry, not this one bottle, but this case of rosé that I had ordered um, so that I can take to Beach Week. And he's like, there's no way that you're going to drink 12 bottles in six days. We weren't not yet married. It was questionable whether or not we'd get across the finish line with a statement like that. But I said to him, darling, how else am I going to make friends? And so I showed up and uh, I unload this case and... Uh, <laughs> Everyone's like, yo, dude, your wife. And he, he was like, yeah, I know. Uh, and I start, like, literally walking around with this bottle. And everyone keeps saying to me, like, oh, I'm not going to drink that white Zinfandel. And I said, I'm going to let you in on the best kept secret. And this awesome woman from Alabama uh, was like, well, I'll have some. 
and I turn around, and here's this, like, tall, gorgeous blonde, and she's like, this is really good. You should stop giving it out for free. <laughs> and I was like, good point. So the two of us drank the rest of that case over the course of the week, and we're still best friends to this day. Marion Leitner, everybody. So nice to meet you. And our thanks to Jonathan, Michael, and Marion for being here with us. And thank you guys all for coming. This is our final Boston Talks of the season. We will be back in the fall on your way out. Don't forget, you can take photos. Hashtag us, Boston Talks. We've got our dip jar if you want to throw a couple bucks our way for a pair of wonderful sunglasses. This summer, we've got a craft beer festival happening here. We've got a wine and food festival happening in the fall when we will be back. And I want to do a special thanks. Is he over there? Our bartender, Jean, who is who works his butt off all year with us at this. And, like, he's the man. So thank you, Jean. Thank you for coming. And we'll see you in September. Have